Thank you everyone um, for staying through our panel. And I feel really privileged to go after Olivia um, because our papers are so much in conversation with each other. Um, and I came to, I'm still developing this chapter and I'm coming to it um, in two major forms. Um, and one question that I had when going into this chapter um, was about the ecological dispersals of the Vietnam War, um, which is part of my larger project, and thinking about Guam as a key site that was mobilized um, in military buildups during the Cold War and the Vietnam War. Um, and I actually went to the National Archives to do research for this project where I had to meet with an archivist um, where you had to like check in and get their consent to access these materials. And I asked the archivist like, um, what information do you have on the environmental impacts of the, the Vietnam War on Guam? And he kind of looked at me as if I was the first person who had ever asked that question and um, said that he didn't know how to access that information and that it would be very difficult for me to find it. Um, so that was one entry that I'm kind of approaching this project in terms of um, what the limitations were in the archive and how do we think about um, the limitations of environmental impact statements and also um, in terms of environmental education and impact statements as a kind of decolonizing terrain. Um, and my other entree, uh, entry was through Craig Santos Perez's series of poems um, about avian extinction and the Micronesian kingfisher, where he's uh, thinking through um, extinction as a legacy of settler colonialism and military occupation on Guam. And I want to think about avian extinction not only as a metaphor, um, for colonization of the Chamorro people, but also um, what we can gain from thinking with the Micronesian kingfisher and um, mourning for species that are not completely extinct, but um, whose ways of life have already been lost. Um, so this is, this is a picture of a Micronesian kingfisher and um, I wanted to start by giving a little bit of background information and showing you this video. Um, so in 1984, a group of U.S. biologists captured the last remaining Micronesian kingfishers from Guam to be shipped to American zoos in an effort to save the dwindling bird population from extinction. Dubbed the Guam Bird Rescue Project, the collaboration between the Guam Division of Aquatic and Wildlife Resources and American zoos on the continent culminated in a captive breeding program that would increase the bird population and reintroduce the birds back into Guam. As journalist David Quammen describes, the American biologists were too late to save the white eye, the fantail, or the flycatcher, but they successfully captured the last Guam rails and the Micronesian kingfishers quote, kept vigil over other native birds that by now were badly endangered, and even, quote, accompanied the first six pairs of kingfishers on a sequence of long airline flights from Guam to New York, nurse meeting them in a passenger cabin with a supply of live geckos for food. He kind of portrays these American scientists as devoted caretakers of the Micronesian kingfisher, um, his story aligned with this narration of conservation that was championed by zoos and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which saw the bird's capture as a heroic act that rescued the species from extinction. And in 1990, in 1990, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service published a recovery plan for the native forest birds of Guam, which included standard procedures of care and survival assessments for the Micronesian kingfisher in, that, in captivity. And this is a video of um, a staff member at the Chicago Zoo who's hand rearing a Micronesian kingfisher chick um, who's been separated from his parents. I'm the curator of birds and reptiles for the Chicago Zoological Society at Brookfield Zoo. I'm happy to announce that on March 9th, Brookfield Zoo hatched its 53rd Micronesian kingfisher chick. I'm going to take you behind the scenes to show you how we are caring for this chick whose species is extinct in the wild because of the unintentional introduction of the brown tree snake on its native island of Guam. 
When this chick hatched, the animal program staff made the decision to hand rear it. This was because the parents had laid a total of two eggs, and it is very unusual for the species to raise more than one chick at a time. By hand rearing one of the chicks and having the parents raise the other, we increase the chance of survival for both chicks. This chick is doing really well under the professional care of our trained keeper staff. It gets fed several times a day with a diet that includes a variety of insects and other small prey. The chick's eyes won't open until it's around 12 days old. Because it can't see right away, at feeding time, keepers touch the side of its beak to let it know its meal is ready, much like the parents do. It is weighed daily so staff can monitor its growth. This serves as a reference for how much food it should be receiving at each feeding in order to make sure that it's within a healthy weight range. Micronesian kingfishers typically fledge when they are 30 days old. They stay with the parents for a couple of additional weeks before they leave to find their own territory. It's hoped that one day we'll be able to reintroduce this species back into the wild. So I'm kind of thinking um, alongside Craig Santos Perez in um, conceptualizing these species recovery projects as violent care um, or a system of care in which um, Obviously, there's a painstaking process involved in ensuring the survival and reproduction of the kingfisher um, that results in a type of violence um, done to uh, the species of the bird, but also to um, that's really indicative of the dispersals of militarization and continued colonization. Um, reading Perez's poetry on the extinction of Guam's avian life alongside the Guam Bird Rescue Project, I trace the dispersed effects of militarized occupation in Guam to foreground the interdependency of human and more than human lives in struggles for species survival and indigenous self-determination. I extend indigenous, feminist, and new materials thought and, of relation by scholars such as Brandy Nalani McDougall Amy Bong, Mel Chen, and Anna Singh, who emphasize the vibrancy of more than human worlds to argue that the material impact of settler colonialism and empire must be understood in a multi-species context. <coughs> Through this case study of the Micronesian kingfisher, I ask how might studies of US militarism and the environment also de engage decolonial knowledges and build demilitarized worlds that honor animals, oceans, and birds as intimate kin and active participants in global history. Born from a convergence of military occupation and ecological conservation, the U.S. state-sponsored plan for the Micronesian Kingfisher captive propagation proposes a narrative of rescue and recovery. Although this recovery project could be understood as an environmentalist response to the devastating effects of U.S. militarization in the Pacific, I argue that these conservation projects enable the continued colonization of Guam by establishing an ideology of scientific stewardship that ensures the U.S. military's continued occupation of Chamorro land. As these re recovery efforts are carried out in mainland zoos, the U.S. government continues its military and colonial expansion on Chamorro lands and Pacific waters, simultaneously coordinating military buildup projects and conservation projects that undermine the sovereignty of this Chamorro people. For American scientists working in species conservation, the capture of the kingfisher in Guam and the subsequent recovery efforts and refuges are designed as reproductive experiments to maximize chances of species survival. These experiments rely on a set of empirical practices, including the standardization of captive management, data collection, and record keeping that transform acts of interspecies kinship and care into a colonial project, justifying U.S. intervention through the language of rescue, recovery, and stewardship which Perez has named violent care. In Northwest Guam, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service established the Guam National Wildlife Refuge in 1993 on land that the Department of Defense confiscated from Chamorro landowners at the height of the Cold War. This transfer of land to another U.S. federal agency for species conservation reveals the military's enduring interest in conservation and habitat recovery as strategies to ensure U.S. occupation 
of indigenous lands. And while the extinction of the kingfisher and Tremoro's dispossession can be read as these singular examples of threatened life at the periphery of larger political and military forces. Why did I oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of creepy. <laughs> he wanted a voice in the matter. <laughs> I, okay, this is a good slide to land on. Um, so I argue that uh, these studies of um, threatened island life and decolonization are actually essential to studies of Pacific militarisms on a global scale. Due to its strategic location in the Pacific Ocean, Guam has been a pivotal site for the U.S. empire and its expansion into the Asia-Pacific world. And as Elizabeth DeLaurie points out, Guam was administered by the growing American empire as if the island was a ship. And as Shran Shu and Evan Espiritu Gandhi reveal, Guam also played a key role in the Vietnam War, which directly contributed to the military buildup on the island in the 1960s, um, including on Anderson Air Force Base and Rotidium Point, um, which uh, were training facilities and um, pre-deployment um, bases for Pacific Air Force security personnel um, and it was used as a strategic site to launch these large-scale bombing raids of Southeast Asia and later host refugee rescue op operations and store large amounts of the toxic defoliant Agent Orange during and after the Vietnam War. Um, and this is a screenshot from one of Craig Santos Perez's, what he calls poem, poem maps. Um, and it shows Retidium Point and how the live firing range would affect um, this region um, and the protected um, limestone forests in the area, which really speaks to how mapping um, in my larger projects, I talk about how mapping is used to um, as a strategy to extract land and destabilize indigenous ownership. Um, so I'm going to skip over this. Um, okay, so paradoxically, I argue that the US military has maintained claims to Chamorro land in the name of conservation because of the mil military's devastating effects on the environment. Um, the Navy partnered with the Fish and Wildlife Service to adopt the conservation technique of, quote, enhancement as a strategy to fulfill the requirements of the Endangered Species Act, which requires the military to enhance an acre of forest for every acre the Department of Defense raises. While touted as a chance to restore pristine forests by the DOD, enhancement depends on the logics of further environmental destruction and accelerated militarization. Claiming to be stewards of the land at Anderson, the Air Force routinely publicizes their conservation efforts. Um, and there is a lot of public spectacle around like building a fence um, around the last um, ancestral tree and um, the orchestration of um, brown tree snake uh, cleanup and um, round up efforts. And um, the military has really renewed its interest in restoring kingfisher habitats as part of this enhancement plan to mitigate for loss of recovery habitat. Following Teresia Taiwa's assertion that militarism seeps into much more fundamental aspects of social and cultural life, I reveal that militarism in the Pacific continues to shape dominant cultural ideas about race, indigeneity, and the environment positioning Chamorro wildlife as in need of rescue and Chamorro people as lacking environmental knowledge. Um, and in the longer piece, I think through um, testimonies in the draft environmental impact statement and how Chamorro people were always pitted against environmental education or um, seen as um, people who needed to be protected from further extinction. Um, so I argue that avian species recovery projects can also be understood not only in um, the rootedness of the continued militarization of indigenous Tremoro land, but also um, through the framework of trans-oceanic trans movement and diasporas. 
Although studies of diaspora have prioritized human life, I suggest that, um, and I argue that Craig Santos Press also discursively traces the roots and interde interdependent relationships of the Micronesian kingfisher, which can reveal counter narratives of interspecies intimacies and transoceanic diasporas. Citing the seafaring technique pukoth, or taking inventory of creatures indigenous to a given island, as well as their travel habitats and behavior, Perez shows how falling birds' flight patterns can illuminate islands as, quote, moving and expanding in accordance with the bird's location. An attention to avian flight reveals islands moving in and out of visibility in a vast ocean, existing in relation to its wildlife, other island worlds, and colonial histories. Contrary to American biologists' narratives of rescue, Perez reveals that the efforts to transport the kingfisher from Guam to the mainland is a part of a violent history of capture and control, which also extends to the forced displacement of the Chamorro population enlisting in the U.S. military. In Island of No Bird Song, Perez resurrects the description of the cage in the passage about Chamorro military enlistment. And he uses these verbs um, such as flock and ensnared um, that become interchangeable in descriptions of the kingfishers and the Chamorro people, um, which signals a shared condition of confinement. These brackets around the we um, in the stanza represent a figurative cage. And along with this first person plural we, the bracket also sets apart a category of horizontal <laughs> affiliation between the Chamorro soldiers and the captive birds. Noting the statistic that Chamorro had the highest per capita enlistment rates, Perez's question, is this our, our species survival plan, challenges both Chamorro's support for the military as a mode of social and economic survival and the colonial logics of species recovery that justify violent care as a singular option against extinction. Naming both colonial processes as the same species survival plan addresses the common condition of precarity that Micronesian kingfishers and Chamorro subjects share as they enter a multi-species diaspora. Um, how am I doing on time? So, one more minute. You're old. Oh no! <laughs> okay, this is my conclusion. <laughs> Two sentences. Yeah, <laughs> um, so, I argue that um, Perez's poetry really assembles a diasporic history of the Micronesian kingfisher, and uh, he asks the question of us um, what fragments will we shore? Um, which I think takes on new meanings of not only excavation and species recovery, but also mutual healing and care of the forms of wounded life that are surfacing within regimes of colonialism and militarism. And these gathering um, strategies of poetic gathering of fragments um, from dominant narratives of species recovery and Chamorro history is one way to attune to the absences that extinction leaves in its wake. Um, and when reassembled, these fragments of species recovery narratives tell us another story about non-human knowledge and laws as a process that occurs across generations, revealing that multi-species kinship can provide alternative understandings of indigenous decolonization and demilitarization. Thank you so much.